So hello everyone and welcome to this lecture about uh, photo dissociation regions and uh, so also called PDRs and PDR models. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to, to present this lecture. And second, I want to say that I, I designed uh, this presentation not as a review talk, but as a lecture, which means I'm not going to try to give you a complete overview of the most recent developments in, in PDR studies. What I'm going to try is to give you an understanding of the physics of PDRs and uh, what kind of uh, physical and chemical process you need in a PDR model so that you know what you're doing if one day you have to use or even develop a, a PDR model. OK, so let's start. First, um, photo dissociation regions, what are those? So uh, photo dissociation regions are region of uh, neutral uh, interstellar clouds that are impacted by UV photons. For instance, one very uh, well-known PDR is at the edge of the horse head. Uh, you probably have seen this uh, picture a lot of times. And you have uh, O stars, depending on PDRs, it might be B stars or, or groups, clusters of O and uh, B stars that are irradiating the edge of this uh, neutral uh, molecular cloud. So the first thing to understand here is that because the definition of PDR is a neutral region that's subjected to uh, UV photons, all the photons that were able to ionize uh, hydrogen have al already been absorbed in the H2 region that's that, uh, be, that is between uh, the PDR and the stars. So the UV field illuminating a PDR starts at uh, 912 angstrom, so wavelengths uh, larger than uh, 912 uh, angstrom. So then what will happen in a PDR? In a PDR, you, you have a lot of UV photons arriving on a dense molecular cloud. So uh, an FUV photon will dissociate, so destroy uh, molecules. So you will have a progressive transition from the molecular state that's deep inside the cloud with uh, molecular hydrogen and uh, CO uh, being the main uh, molecules. And progressively, you will, as you get closer to the edge, you will have UV photon destroying those molecules and you will tr progressively transition towards uh, atomic hydrogen, ionized carbon, because the ionization threshold of, uh, of uh, carbon is lower than hydrogen. So FUV photon can ionize uh, carbon and uh, atomic uh, oxygen. So PDRs are the region where you find this very important transition from atomic gas, which is inert for star formation, to molecular gas, which is the reservoir of uh, matter for star formation. So of course, in PDR, uh, the physics and the chemistry will be dominated by the energy that's uh, injected by the FUV photons coming from the stars. And to give you a first overview of uh, what will be the important components, so the key players in a PDR, you will have, of course, the, the gas. Uh, you have to keep in mind that in a PDR, you will have from molecules to ions, so you will have some uh, free electrons, even if it's natural gas, because some species, such as carbon or sulfur, can be ionized and provide uh, free electrons. You will have dust grains that play a very important role. And the process injecting energy into this medium will be UV photons coming from the stars. And also uh, cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are more uh, um, usually more considered as the, the source of energy deep inside molecular clouds. But in a PDR, you will have a transition zone between a region where everything is dominated by the energy of UV photons towards a region where it's the energy of cosmic rays that dominate. So you will have a transition regions where uh, both are important. And uh, the important point to notice about PDR is that what PDRs do is that they reprocess the UV radiation of uh, 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 hot young stars into infrared. And I draw here a very simple uh, schematic of, of the energy transfers uh, in a PDR. So you have FUV photons. Most of the energy uh, from FUV photon will be absorbed by dust grains. And then dust grain will, uh, so it will warm up the dust grains, which will become warmer, so they will emit more in the infrared. And most of the energy they receive will be re-emitted as a dust infrared emission. But a few percent will be uh, 
transmitted to the gas through a mechanism called uh, the photoelectric heating mechanism. I will talk a bit more about it later. A few percent will be given to the gas, and this few percent will be re-radiated by the gas in the form of uh, line emission from uh, atoms, ions, and molecules. Uh, and so you see that all of the uh, FUV energy will have been at the end converted into uh, infrared emission. And I will talk a bit more about the, those process later, but there is also a, a bit of direct heating of the gas by uh, FUV photons. So second, the, the very important question, of course, is why do we want to study uh, PDRs? Uh, it would seem that it's a very uh, narrow definition. It's just the edge regions of uh, molecular clouds. But actually, no, because if you consider star forming regions, which are a very uh, uh, important subject in astrophysics, in a star forming region, you will have molecular clouds and a lot of newborn O and B stars. So in a star forming region, all of the cloud surfaces will be uh, PDRs. And as we said, PDRs transform the UV uh, uh, radiation into infrared radiation. And as a result, when you observe galaxies uh, nearby or very far away, a large fraction of the infrared spectra that you receive is actually emitted by the PDRs. The collectively by all the PDRs in the galaxies. So understanding PDRs is very important to understand the infrared spectra of uh, galaxies. Another uh, reason why PDRs are very interesting to, int to uh, study is that in PDR you find a, 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 rare co a rare combination of molecular gas that is warm with high excitation condition because of the temperature and because of the UV photons. We'll uh, talk about this in detail later. Because of this, you will have a very large number of tracers, molecules, atoms, ions that will emit. So you will have a lot of uh, observational constraints that will allow you to study in detail the physical conditions in uh, star forming regions. And, and those regions, the PDRs, are the regions where the molecular clouds are subjected to the feedback, the radiative feedback of uh, the newborn stars. And as you probably know, feedback is a very uh, important question today in uh, understanding star formation. Uh, one other reason why uh, PDR models are very important is that actually this definition of PDRs as neutral regions where UV photons are important is actually much broader than just those uh, dense PDRs in star forming regions. Because you might know that most of the molecular of the mass of molecular cloud lies at in regions with AV, so the visual extinction, measuring how much matter is shielding uh, the gas, lower than eight, which means that in most of the mass of molecular clouds, there are still UV photons coming from the outside. They have not all been uh, uh, absorbed. You can see also that diffuse clouds are subject, they have a low extinction and they are subject to the background UV field, which is a collective uh, field of all the stars in the galaxies. So they are also uh, subjected to PDR-like physics. Also, they have uh, other source of energy that are important, which will be turbulence and shock. And uh, finally, um, other kind of objects, such as protoplanet planetary disks or uh, planetary nebula also have this combination of dense neutral gas uh, submitted to uh, uh, strong UV fields, so they are controlled by PDR physics. So the PDRs that we observe in star forming regions, which, as I said, have a lot of uh, observational constraint, are really an ideal laboratory to study very important uh, ISM physical and chemical processes that are important in a very large range of environments. Okay, so uh, what does a PDR look like? Uh, a PDR, in a PDR, you will have the FUV photon acting on the gas and they will have two main effects. First, they will dissociate molecule and ionize uh, atoms. And so on, they will also inject energy into the gas. So they will warm up the gas. Um, at the edge of the PDR, all the uh, species with ionization potentials higher than hydrogen will uh, remain atomic because, as I said, all the photons that could ionize hydrogen have been absorbed. But the species with uh, ionization potential lower than hydrogen will be in an ionized state. And as you progress deeper into the cloud, uh, the FUV photon will be progressively extinguished by dust and also by absorption in lines by uh, or in the continuum by atoms and, and molecules. And so progressively, you will have less and less. Uh, 
uh, UV photon, and you will have chemical transitions from uh, the simplest uh, state, for instance, uh, atomic hydrogen towards the molecular state, uh, molecular hydrogen, and the same for carbon from C plus to C and to CO. And at the same time, as you progress in depth in the PDR, you will also have a decreasing temperature as there are less and less UV photons to uh, warm up the gas. So I summarized this here with this uh, diagram, where you have here the, the, the illuminating stars. Of course, in front of the PDR, you will have an H2 region, but this is not the subject of this lecture. And then you reach the ionization front, so the limit between the regions where hydrogen is ionized and the region where uh, hydrogen is atomic, and this is the start of the PDR. You will then first have an atomic region where everything is either atomic or ionized for carbon, uh, sulfur, and so on. This region will usually be pretty warm from several hundred kelvins to a few thousand kelvins. As you progress and the UV field is absorbed, you will have the transition from atomic hydrogen to molecular hydrogen. So you will have a region where Hydrogen is uh, molecular, but carbon is still in C plus uh, form. And there is a very interesting chemistry here we will talk about uh, later. And then you will have a, a, a transition from C plus to CO and so on until you reach the uh, cold molecular cloud, which is governed by the, uh, quite different uh, chemistry. And so the typical temperature in these warm molecular regions are of a few or several hundreds of kelvins. So all of those molecules and species will be able to uh, emit uh, lines in the infrared and in the radio uh, domain. Um, <clears throat> so PDRs have been observed for a long time and the tracers that have been used and that have been the focus of the studies of PDRs have uh, shifted depending on the telescopes that were available, of course, because as you know, uh, so, as I said, most of the emission of PDR is in uh, the infrared, uh, especially the infrared lines of uh, atoms, and ions, and molecules that gives us a lot of uh, constraints. But infrared observation most often needs space telescopes, uh, apart from uh, limited atmospheric windows. And so, depending on the infrared uh, wavelength range that was available with the telescopes of the time, in different time period, people have focused on different tracers. Fine. One example is that there was a shift between a, a focus on uh, understanding H2 emission in PDRs when uh, Spitzer, which is here, was in operation. And then when Herschel came along, which was more towards the far infrared uh, domain, so could, it couldn't observe H2, there was a shift to understanding uh, excited uh, CO rotational lines. Uh, that that uh, were not studied before because they couldn't, uh, for most of them, they couldn't be observed before. And soon there will be a switch back to H2 because, as you know, uh, JWST will be launched soon and will be able to observe tens of uh, raw vibrational lines of uh, H2. Uh, but you see here, there was a large gap. And during this gap, uh, um, quite a lot of people have focused on the radio and millimeter domain because it's observable from, uh, ground, from the ground. And there are also a large number of molecular emission lines, maybe coming from a, a slightly colder regions of the PDR. But the interest here is that in this domain, we now have, we now have a large interferometers ALMA, NOEMA, and so this gave us for the first time access to very high spatial resolution in, in PDRs. And this is very important because um, the typical thickness of PDRs, at least for dense PDRs in star forming region is very small of the order of uh, 10 to the minus uh, three parsecs for uh, very dense PDRs. And so it was not until uh, ALMA that we could start to hope to resolve uh, especially the PDR. And you see here uh, recent ALMA observations by uh, Javier Goicochea, uh, both in uh, common tracers such as CO and HCO, plus, but uh, also as there was this shift toward uh, the radio and millimeter domain, people started to get interested in completely new tracers such as SH, plus, because they were observable by, by uh, ALMA. And th there is a very interesting chemistry behind uh, this, and we will also talk about it later. So PDR models now, so that are models that try to model those uh, interface, those surface layers uh, where the FUV field has a very strong impact. 
So um, fundamentally, because it's a surface layer and it's governed by the extension of UV as a function of depth in the PDR, fundamentally, they are one D structures, at least two first orders. Of course, there are more complicated effects when you start to consider 2D or 3D geometry, but I, I, I won't have time to talk about this uh, here. So the way most PDR models work is by assuming an, a slab, an infinite slab geometry. So a slab of gas, which is infinite orthogonally uh, to the direction of the radiation field. Oops, sorry. And the model only describes the variations of, uh, for instance, the chemical abundances, the temperature, and so on, uh, as a function of depth in this direction only. Some models also adopt a spherical geometry, which is also 1D if you assume a spherical symmetry, uh, which is a slightly different assumption and can have uh, uh, an impact on the predictions of the model. And also there are a lot of small things that can seem to be small details that differ between uh, PDR models, but that can al also have uh, quite important effects on the predictions. Uh, for instance, the geometry of the illumination of the UV field, if you assume all the photons to arrive in the from the same direction, it's not the same as if you assume uh, the photon to or the radiation field to be spread equally across all angles, because here, the, the photons that arrive at a high uh, incidence angle will, you see that to reach a given depth, they will have to uh, travel a longer uh, physical dis distance across the cloud. So actually they will be more extinguished uh, at a given depth than photons that would arrive uh, only along this uh, direction. So those are things to keep in mind when you compare different uh, PDR models. Uh, so in what I will talk about, there are a few uh, notations that are important and a few uh, uh, definitions. So if you want to cha characterize a PDR, of course the first and the main external parameter, so the parameter describing the environment of the, of the PDR, the most important is the FUV radiation field that is uh, impacting the PDR. The so problem, of course, is that uh, uh, an FUV radiation field is a spectrum. So it's not a single parameter. You can see here a comparison from, uh, of a different kind of a radiation field. Uh, for, from in, for instance, a radiation field that would be emitted by the sun, by a, a hotter star at 10,000 K, and then uh, estimation of the average uh, radiation field in the galaxy, which we call uh, interstellar standard radiation field, ISRF, uh, which is the field collectively emitted by uh, all stars. So if you place yourself at a random location in the galaxy, which is not near a specific star, that, that is expected to be the kind of radiation field that you would uh, receive. And for the estimation of this interstellar standard radiation field, there, are, there has been actually several of them, and you can see that they are quite different. So to simplify all of this, what uh, people do quite often is that they measure the strength of the UV field simply by taking its ratio to a standard field in a specific wavelength range. So in PDRs, because the most important photons are between 912 angstroms to uh, 2,400 angstroms, they compare the, the total energy density in this wavelength range to a standard value, which is the value for this prescription, the one from having uh, nine, uh, 1968 uh, for the ISRF, uh, and they take this single number as representative of the strength of the UV field. Uh, so this is usually in, uh, written G0, and sometimes you will find this notation chi, uh, which is simply say, because in a lot of models, what people do is they take the ISRF and simply scale it by a factor that they call chi to represent the fact that uh, the stars are, there are stars close to the PDR. So the radiation field is stronger than the average radiation field in the galaxy. But to first order, you can consider that chi is the same thing as G0. It will be slightly different depending on the uh, kind of field used, but the difference will be at most a factor of a few. And the other very important parameter will be uh, parameters that describes the, the condition in the PDR itself will be the gas density. Uh, everything else 
uh, PDR models will be able to compute it from those two parameters, for instance, the temperature, the uh, chemical state, and so on. And so the parameters we use to describe the gas density is the density of hydrogen nuclei in all forms, so which I will uh, write n uh, subscript h. So uh, this is equal to the sum of the density of all species containing uh, h. But of course, in a PDR, you need to assume a prescription about how the density is varying. And so what people were doing for a long time is assuming a constant density. And actually, it's much easier to understand the physics and understand what is happening in a PDR model when you do this assumption. But actually, a more realistic assumption is probably to use constant thermal pressure uh, across the PDR. Uh, just a, a small word about what what surround PDRs. And PDRs are not isolated. They are usually located at the edge, especially dense PDRs are usually located at the edge of uh, H2 regions. And so just a word about H2 regions. There are two pretty important phases in uh, H2 regions. If we neglect the early stages, uh, the, the H2 region can either be embedded into a molecular cloud and expanding due to its own thermal pressure, because of course, you know that ionized gas has a temperature, a typical temperature of around 10,000 K. The molecular cloud has an, a typical temperature of let's say 15 K. So for, of course there is a very large, if initially you ionize this region without the gas having time to move, there is a very large pressure difference between the two. And so the H2 region will expand uh, because of the pressure difference. And this will con con uh, produce a compressed neutral shell around the uh, H2 region. You can also have another scenario, which is when the uh, H2 region is close to the edge of the molecular clouds, at some point it will reach the edge. And then the hot high pressure ionized gas can escape into the surrounding low pressure uh, ISM. And in this case, you will have a, a somewhat different scenario where because you remove the gas, you, you keep ionizing a new gas at the ionization front, and you have a process called photo evaporation. Uh, um, and in this case, you have also, I, I don't have time to explain why, but you also have a compression effect at the edge of the H2 region. So just the thing to remember from this is that we expect that PDR regions around H2 region ha, ha, are compressed. So you expect to find their densities that are uh, higher than the pre-existing density of the molecular cloud. So now let's, uh, this figure shows typical results like you can expect from uh, a PDR code. Uh, for instance, here it's a model from, for the Orion bar PDR, which is a, another very uh, uh, studied uh, PDR. So you see here the way um, what's computed by a PDR code is that you will compute the evolution of the different physical condition as a function of position or depth in the cloud. So here it's given in physical distance in milliparsecs, you see that indeed uh, the size of the PDR is a few milliparsecs, not more. The thickness of the PDR, for, of course, this is for a dense PDR. And here you, it's, it's translated into visual extension. Very often people uh, prefer to show this as a function of visual extension. Uh, so this gives an idea of how much of the uh, radiation field is extinguished reaching the different uh, points. By, uh, it only accounts for extinction by dust. So you see here first uh, the density and temperature of the gas. So here it was a model assuming uh, constant pressure. So as the temperature of the gas, which initially is, as I said, of a few thousand uh, kelvins, as this temperature decreases uh, and finally reaches a few tens of kelvins, uh, because we assume constant thermal pressure, we have a density gradients in the PDR. And this is also uh, has very important effects on the prediction of uh, line intensities. From the, the model also computes the uh, chemical abundances of the different species. I show here only the main species. So you can see, for instance, in blue, atomic hydrogen, and in green, uh, molecular hydrogen, with the transition from one to the other occurring around here. And you also have a similar transition between C plus in light blue uh, atomic carbon in, in orange and uh, CO uh, in red. Uh, 
So, uh, and of course, the uh, PDR code need to also predict line intensities because that's what we observe. And so you can also compute. So here it's the local emissivity, which gives you an idea, an idea of where the different lines which are listed here, lines, rotational line of uh, H2, uh, vibrational line of H2, CO lines, and so on. You can compute where they are emitted in the cloud. So here they are normalized, but you can also compute the total intensity that's emitted that you compare to your observation. So now the question, and what I want to focus this uh, presentation uh, on is what is the physics that we need in the models to compute all of this? What is the physics that we need to understand to understand PDRs? Um, the most uh, central thing in PDRs, or at least the, the well, the most basic is PDRs are the regions where you have this transition from atomic hydrogen to molecular hydrogen. So that's the first thing we need to understand. So let's talk first about H2 formation. Uh, one thing to understand about H2 formation is that H2 is much more stable than uh, atomic hydrogen. So when you form H2, you uh, uh, get, you liberate 4.5 EV of energy. Of course, if you form H2, you need to get rid of this energy, otherwise, H2 will uh, dissociate again into uh, atomic hydrogen. The problem is that uh, H2 is a symmetric molecule, which means that it has no uh, dipolar radiative transition and quadrupolar radiative transition are very slow, which means that forming H2 by, and getting rid of the energy by emitting a photon is very inefficient. There are other uh, gas phase routes that are possible, for instance, three body reactions, because if you get three bodies and one of the H can uh, get away and can uh, take away part of the energy as kinetic energy. But of course, for three body uh, reactions, you need very high density. So usually this is not very efficient. And there is also uh, an in indirect route uh, by going to H minus and then forming H2. But this is also very slow in ISM conditions. It's only important in uh, the primordial universe when there was uh, no dust, because actually what dominates uh, H2 formation, at least in, in the, at the current time, is uh, uh, dust grains that can play the role of catalyst. Because if H2 forms on grain, then the energy that's liberated can be transmitted to the grain and, uh, and H2 can stay as H2 and not uh, dissociate again. So to the first order, the, the <coughs> Um, the idea is that the formation reaction of H2 uh, is when each atom collide with a grain. So the formation rate should be proportional to the product of the abundance of H atom and the abundance of grain. But in the ISM, we assume that the fraction of grains relative to the gas is constant. So the abundance of grain is proportional simply to the density. So the formation rate will have the form of this, uh, like this expression with a coefficient here which indicates the efficiency of this uh, formation mechanisms of, on those grain. I will talk about formation mechanisms later, but you can already have a very simple uh, expression, which is simply saying that uh, the, the efficiency will be dependent on the total surface uh, of dust. It will, will depend, of course, on, of, on the thermal velocity, because you are talking about collisions, and you hide all of the physics of uh, H2 formation into an average efficiency. But what people do, uh, or athlete, actually did uh, very often up to recently, is simply use an efficiency for this reaction, which is derived from observation with this typical value of 3 to the minus uh, 70. So then, what will control the uh, H2 to H2, H2 transition is the balance between H2 formation, so we just talked about this, and H2 uh, destruction. And of course, in PDR, the main destruction mechanism for H2 will be UV photons. To understand H2 photo dissociation, we need to say a word about uh, the H2 uh, level structure. Uh, so the H2 level structure is a bit complicated. You have, because H2 is a molecule, it can have uh, electronic excited states, which are those different uh, lines, which shows the, the, the energy as a function of distance between the two hydrogens, and also uh, vibrational lines and uh, rotational, uh, vibrational levels, sorry, and uh, rotational levels. The way um, 
So the thing is that in PDRs, as I said, you have no photons about, uh, of energy higher than 13.6 uh, electron volts, which is equivalent to 912 uh, angstroms. And so you cannot directly reach the dissoci dissociated states for H2. So then H2 can only happen indirectly by first absorbing a UV photon that will excite H2 to uh, an electronic excited level. And then this level can de-excite to uh, the continuum of uh, unbound states of the uh, uh, ground electronic states. So it's a two-step process, but of course, most of the time when you excite H2 to an electronic excited state, it will just uh, uh, de-excite rad radiatively back to a bound state and, and not dissociate. And so the typical ratio is that about 15% of the time when it's uh, pumped by UV photons to those electronic levels, it will uh, de-excite uh, to an unbound state and uh, dissociate. So if you want to compute the rate of this photo dissociation reactions, you, you see already that it's, it's pretty complicated because it depends first on the initial level of your H2 molecule before absorbing a UV photon. So, uh, sorry, oops, here it is. Okay, so uh, you will have to uh, sum uh, over the distribution of your H2 molecules across those different uh, levels. And uh, then from each of those levels, you have to uh, sum over uh, all the possible electronic states it can transition to. Oops, sorry. Uh, and for this, you need to know the uh, uh, UV field uh, in each lines corresponding to those transitions. And of course, you need to know also the uh, probability of dissociation in this line, because this is, these are just typical values, but depending on the level, they can vary a bit. So you, you see here already that just to compute this reaction rate, you already need to uh, go deeper into the physics of the PDR because first you need to know the distribution of H2 molecules in the different levels. So you need to compute in detail uh, H2 excitation. And second, you also need to know the radiation field at the wavelengths of each of the lines corresponding to the UV transition to uh, electronic excited state. And this field, will vary with, with position because it will be progressively extinguished by dust, but also by H2 molecules because each photon that dissociate a molecule at some point in the PDR is not available uh, deeper in the PDR to dissociate other molecules. So progressively, uh, H2, will, H2 molecule being dissociated at the edge of the PDR will protect H2 molecules that are deeper in the PDR. So you need as well to compute radiative transfer in order to have an accurate uh, evaluation of those uh, uh, radiation field terms. Uh, of course, there are some uh, simple approximations that are used very often, and I will uh, describe uh, a few. First, for this part, uh, when people don't compute the H2 excitation, very often, they assume some uh, local thermal uh, equilibrium distribution, so a Boltzmann distribution for H2 levels at a set temperature. But of course, this is a problem because you assume in advance a temperature uh, for the PDR without having uh, computed it. And you also assume that the, the distribution is uh, at LTE, which is not always the case. So uh, the second uh, part, so this is for simplifying this part, but the second part here is uh, relative transfer. So let's talk about a bit about radiative transfer. So just a few reminders uh, and definitions. Uh, the, the fundamental quantity for radiative transfer is specific intensity, which measure the, 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 the amount of energy crossing uh, a, a given infinitesimal surface in a given direction. So it might have a, a, a so it depends on the angle uh, of uh, that of propagation, so the direction of propagation of the of the ray, uh, um, and so so th this is the, the definition here. And one quantity that's very often used and which uh, which was appearing here is the uh, energy density of the radiation field, because of course, for instance, H two molecules. Oops, sorry. H2 molecules don't really care about the direction uh, the, the photons are coming from. So it's the, the energy density is just 
and uh, this specific intensity integrated over all angles and uh, divided by uh, C. But to compute radiative transfer, you cannot compute it directly on this quantity because radiative transfer does depend on uh, angles. And the full radiative transfer is given here. There are several terms. The first term corresponds to extinction due to uh, absorption by uh, atoms, ions, molecules, and uh, extinction by uh, dust grains. There is quite often a, 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 so a source term, an emission term, which can come from a gas emission in lines. And also, uh, we will talk about this, dust emission can be uh, very important in, uh, in, the physics and in the physics of PDR. And so this requires uh, solving the level population. So again, we see that to compute radiative transfer, we also need to uh, compute the excitations of the different uh, species. And that's something that will come back quite often. We will see. You start to see it here, but we will see it many more times, that in PDRs, everything is coupled. You cannot solve just one part of the physics, the chemistry or the relative transfer or uh, the excitation of a molecule. You need everything is coupled, and you need to solve everything simultaneously. And this last term here corresponds to uh, scattering by dust. And this is what makes relative transfer very difficult to solve, because it, it uh, redistributes redistributes uh, the radiation field across angles. And so you, you, you really need to use uh, uh, methods that allow to solve this uh, complex equation uh, with this redistribution term. But here for the explanations in this lecture, I will neglect this term um, uh, as we will see uh, later. So let's come back to the question of the HH2 transition. So for the HH2 transition, we only need the radiative transfer because we need the lines that photodissociate H2. So the range of wavelengths of interest is uh, from 912 to uh, 1,100 uh, angstroms. This radiation field, as I said, will decrease with depth because of dust absorption and scattering, and also because of line absorption by H2 itself, which is what we call uh, self-shielding. So as I said here, to simplify the explanation, I will neglect scattering, which is equivalent to uh, assuming pure forward scattering. Then the equation for radiative transfer takes uh, this form. Let's for now uh, neglect uh, the emission term and assume first that there is only dust. In this case, so the equation for radiative transfer is very simple. And you know that the solution takes this form of uh, a decreasing exponential, where you have appearing here the optical depth which is uh, proportional to the uh, physical uh, distance. In this case, uh, if we assume, in addition, that the radiation field is unidirectional, so there is uh, just one direction, then this uh, translates into the same expression for the energy density. And finally, one final simplification for the explanations here, in this range of wavelengths, uh, the, the, the extinction by dust doesn't vary very fast. So let's assume it's uh, constant. And then we can express the energy density at any wavelength uh, simply, oops, sorry, simply as a function of uh, the uh, optical depths at 1,000 uh, angstrom, which is the most, more or less the, the, the middle of this uh, interval. So let's come back to our expression for the photodissociation rate. If you uh, plug this uh, expression for the uh, energy density as a function of depth, you see that the part representing radiative transfer can be uh, factored out. And you have here a term that, we, that only depends on uh, parameters that are constant. B is the Einstein coefficient, it's a physical constant. This is also a, a, a constant uh, property of H2. And your radiation field here, what remains is only the uh, external radiation field. So you can compute it once and for all for the uh, incident radiation field. But here, um, um, sorry. And we can go one step deeper, as I said, one step, step further, sorry. As I said, quite often, this incident radiation field, people assume it to be just proportional to some standard field. And then you can factor out this uh, uh, factor, the sky parameter representing the intensity of the UV field. And uh, this, assuming uh, uh, some distribution for the H2 levels, I, as I said, the simplest way is to assume an LT 
uh, population, this term can be computed once and never vary. And so you can get this simple uh, expression uh, uh, where your photo dissociation rate is depends simply on the intensity of the radiation field and the optical depth uh, at 1000 angstrom. And, 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 and uh, uh, a pro dissociation probability term, which is a constant, but of course, depend on the, your assumption for this standard field. So we will use this very simplified uh, um, expression here. Uh, but here, sorry, I come back to this. We have still neglected a very important aspect. As I said here, we have assumed that there was all, only extinction by dust. The thing is, if you look in, a, in an actual PDR model that computes the radiative transfer fully, if, we, if you look at the uh, energy density of uh, UV radiation um, at a given position, so here I took at an IV of 0.5, so somewhere inside the PDR, but not too deep, and you compare what would be the radiation field if there was extinction by dust only, this is the dotted line, and if, there, if, there, if you include extinction by H2 lines. And you see that actually extinction by H2 lines is extremely important. And so uh, H2 can self-shield, meaning that uh, even if there was no dust protecting it from uh, UV radiation, the photons that are absorbed by H2 molecules and that, that destroy H2 molecule at the edge are not available anymore deeper in the cloud. And so progressively, H2, can, uh, H2 at the edge can shield uh, H2 in the core. So you need to include uh, this effect. And uh, here it becomes impossible to do uh, with simple uh, approximation. You really need to solve the relative, the full equation of the relative transfer, taking into account the absorption by gas here by uh, H2. And for this, the most uh, accurate approach is of course to solve fully the level populations of H2 coupled to the uh, uh, relative transfer. Of course, this is a, a, a difficult numerical, can be difficult numerically because when you do this, you need uh, to solve this equation on a wavelength grid that's fine enough to resolve the line profile of each of those lines because you see that the different lines overlap with, with each other, and this can become uh, numerically costly. Of course, people have used uh, simpler approximation. The simplest idea is to take back, to go back to the simple expression that we derived uh, earlier, and to add simply uh, some uh, empirical function representing the shielding terms. So now, in addition to the dust shielding terms that we had uh, in our very simple calculation at the start, the idea is to include some empirical functions that represent the effect of shielding uh, of H2 by itself. Of course, it will depend on the amount of H2 up to the position that you are considering, so the column density of H2. And for this empirical function, the most commonly used, uh, uh, so we call this a self-shielding function, the most commonly used function is given uh, in Drain and Bertoldi uh, 1996. Uh, but using this has uh, drawbacks. First, it hides many approximations. So the fact that we assume the uh, level population of H2 to be at LTE at some temperature, which might not be uh, the correct temperature in your PDR. And you also assume some uh, spectral shape, shape for the UV field, which might not be the spectral shape of the star that is illuminating your, your PDR. And the second uh, uh, drawback is that of here with this, you take into account shielding for H2 photo dissociation, but you don't know uh, um, how to say this. You, you don't know how much each individual line is shielded. Uh, you only know the global shielding effect. This is okay for photo dissociation, uh, uh, computing the photo dissociation rate. But when you will want to compute uh, H2 level populations, for instance, to predict H2 lines, uh, then you will have a problem because you need to know the, the shielding in each of those lines. Uh, and there is another approximation, which is kind of intermediate, which uses this idea of a, a shielding factor, but does it line by line. So it's a bit better because it allows to compute uh, the H2 excitation, but it neglects the, the effect that the lines are overlapping. You see here, for instance, there is this a very broad line, which is overlapping with the ones that are on the edge. So if you treat uh, shielding line by line, you neglect those uh, overlap effects. And so you, you underestimate uh, 
the effect of H2 cell film. So the best uh, approach is still to fully compute the radiative transform. So now, okay, let's take this uh, simplified uh, expression. Having said all the drawbacks, we can still do a lot of things with it. So now you have an expression for the photo dissociation rate. You have an expression for the formation rate. So uh, as, let's assume for now, uh, in the first step, that you have only hydrogen. So then uh, the equation describing the balance or the chemistry of uh, in your cloud will be this one, where the variation of the abundance of H2 uh, is due to H2 formation and H2 uh, photo dissociation. And of course, you have uh, the second equation, conservation of the total abund elemental abundance of uh, hydrogen nuclei. Uh, the question here, this is a, a, a differential equation which describes the evolution in time, but are time dependent effects important or can we consider stationary PDR? So for this, we need to have a look at uh, characteristic time scales to reach uh, the equilibrium. So if you look at your equation, let's first look at the edge, at the very edge of the cloud. In this case, we get rid of uh, all the relative transfer terms. And you see that from this expression, you can define a characteristic uh, time scale, which is one over chi times uh, the dissociation probability at the edge. And if you compute this for, uh, for instance, a radiation field with a chi of 1000, which is typical of dense uh, PDRs, you see that the, the time scale for your HH2 chemistry is extremely fast, one year. So at least for the edge of the cloud, we know that uh, chemistry is extremely fast and, and a stationary state is almost always uh, uh, suffi uh, sufficient. But now, of course, we don't want to consider only the very edge of the cloud, but we want to consider up to the HH2 transition. Uh, in this case, we will need to estimate, if we use the same approach, we will need to estimate this term. But here, we need to, if we want to estimate this term, we need to know the, the optical depths at which the transition occurs. So we need to actually first solve this equation to estimate the characteristic time scale. But we can actually do a, a simple approximation is that we are looking for the characteristic time scale when we are approaching equilibrium. So uh, when this is approximately zero and near the final position of the transition. So at a position where the abundance of H and the abundance of H2 are roughly equal. And then from uh, this equation, you can see that this is equivalent to taking one over R and H, which is something you can compute. And you find a typical time scale for a density of 10 to the six per centimeter cube, which is also typical of uh, dense uh, PDRs such as zero Ryan bar. You find a time scale of a few uh, thousand years. And you can see here this figure showing the evolution of the abundance of H2 as a function of time, uh, and you see that indeed the edge, in the edge, the H2 is uh, destroyed very quickly, and uh, the position of the transition reaches equilibrium after a few uh, thousand uh, years. So what we can say about this is that those time scales are still quite fast, at least compared to uh, molecular cloud life lifetimes of the order of uh, a million years. And so most PDR codes will assume uh, st that stationary state is rich, but we have to keep in mind that this is an assumption. And uh, if you have important dynamical effects, you might have uh, PDRs that are not in a stationary state. Uh, and, and this is especially true in, in, uh, in if I come back to this, in, in diffuse cloud, I said that diffuse clouds are governed by a, PD, by a physics that's very similar to PDRs, but in diffuse cloud, this time scale would be much longer. And then uh, the dynamics of the gas, such as turbulence, can become uh, can have a very important role and keep uh, the, the chemistry out of equilibrium. <clears throat> so at least in dense PDR, we will consider uh, uh, that a stationary state is reached. So then the equation becomes uh, simply this. And from looking at this equation, you can see that you can form one dimensionless parameter. So for now, we will assume uh, that the density is constant, which is uh, this parameter, chi times the, uh, probab the dissociation probability at the edge over the H2 formation efficiency times the density. This and this are physical constants. 
And the only physical parameters describing your PDR are the chi, the UV field strength, and the density. So you, from this very simple uh, reasoning, you can see that you expect the qualitative behavior in the PDR to depend on the ratio of K over NH. And as I said, K is approximately the same as G naught, so G naught over NH. And indeed, there will be two qualitatively different regimes. When you are at low G naught over NH, typically lower than 10 to the minus two, you are in what we call the weak field regime. And in this case, uh, what happened is that the H2 dissociating photons will be mostly absorbed by H2 and not by dust. And uh, as a result, the H2, the H2, H2 transition will be quite gradual and the transition will move quickly as you change the G0 over NH. And when you reach high uh, G0 over NH ratio, higher than uh, 10 to the minus two, um, you will reach a different regime, the strong field regime, in which um, <coughs> the photons that can dissociate H2 are mostly absorbed by dust. And as a result, the transition doesn't move very much after that uh, when you change G0 over NH. And in this regime, the HH2 transition is typically at an AV of close to one. But in the weak field regime, it can vary quite a lot from uh, 10 to the main, an AV of 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus three up to an AV of one. If you want more details about this, this is uh, studied in, in detail analytically in this uh, paper by Sternberg et al, uh, 2014. So now we have talked a lot about hydrogen because it's uh, really the basic component that controls the structure of the PDR. But of course, chemistry goes beyond hydrogen. So the question one might think that in PDRs, because PDRs are photodissociation regions, we might expect that all molecules are destroyed in PDR and that there is no interesting chemistry in PDRs. This is not the case at all. The reason is that because you have a, a lot of energy input from UV photons, and as we've seen, because the chemical time scales are very short, we can have a lot of very reactive species that are short-lived that can be abundant only in PDRs. You will not find them in uh, dense cold molecular clouds, but you can find them in uh, PDRs. For instance, very reactive species such as reactive ions, for instance, CH plus, CO plus, or, or radicals like OH or CN, and you will have a, a wealth of uh, uh, chemical species like small hydrocarbons, C2H, C3H2. And you see here, for instance, a line survey in the millimeter domain for the Orion bar PDRs, where more, around 60 uh, molecules were uh, detected. And you see, for instance, here, the distribution of uh, C2H uh, in the PDR, which is very close to the edge of the PDR that's uh, uh, traced by uh, H2 vibrational uh, emission. So, this means that in a PDR, you need to solve a, a, a larger chemical network than just H2. If you want to predict all of those uh, tracers and understand all of those molecules that are observed. So, which means that instead of having, if I come back here, just one equation, the balance between formation and destruction for H2, you will have a system of equation and you will have one equation for each species giving the balance between the formation, which is the sum over all formation reactions for the species that you consider, and uh, destruction, the same, it's the sum over all the possible destruction reactions for this uh, species. And of course, the reaction rates that are here uh, can be a function of many different uh, local parameters. Of course, the abundances of the reactants, but also the temperature, the UV radiation field, and all of those can vary with depth with the PDR. And you see here that uh, chemistry will be coupled to other aspects of the physics. For instance, you will need to compute the temperature of the gas if you want to compute the chemistry. And we will see uh, many more uh, couplings uh, uh, in, in, in a few moments. So in a PDR, you will have different types of uh, reactions. I won't have time to go into the details, but you have reactions that are uh, two body reactions. So one species A reacts with a species B. It might be neutral neutral reaction. If both are neutral, it might be an ion neutral reaction or a recombination reaction if one of them is an electron. 
In this case, the reaction rate will take this form with uh, uh, the proportional to the product of the abundances of your uh, reactants and a rate coefficient, which usually takes the form of a simple uh, fit formula uh, uh, with uh, some free par some uh, parameters. And you can find the values of those parameters in uh, chemical databases such as uh, KIDA or uh, UMIST. Uh, just a word of warning, when you use those uh, um, uh, parameters from databases. Those come, of course, from ex either experimental or theoretical uh, results. And quite often, they are, those results are valid only for a limited range of temperatures. And the problem is, of course, in PDRs, because you go from the very hot edge to the very cold uh, core, you have a very wide uh, range of conditions. And quite often, often, the range of conditions in PDR is wider than the range of validity of those data. So you always need to be very careful about extrapolations uh, uh, in this. So this, this is for two-body reactions. You have, of course, very important in PDR photo reactions. We talked about photo dissociation of H2. In general, the rate of those reactions can be expressed as proportional to the abundance of the species and uh, a, a photo dissociation probability, which will, of course, depend uh, on the position because the strength, as I said, of the radiation field decreases with position. And so the general expression is that this uh, dissociation probability is a product of some cross section of the uh, reaction, which depends on wavelengths, times the uh, strength of the uh, UV field. We saw for H2 that this was only in lines. So you're in, for H2, for instance, your cross-section would be uh, a collection of uh, discrete lines. But for some other species, it can be a continuous uh, function. I will say a word about this uh, on the next slide. But let's first uh, uh, talk about the simplest expression that's used very often. Uh, the simplest approximation is to approximate this rate as uh, simply um, something instead of having an integral over the spectrum, simply express it as proportional to the strength of the UV field and approximate the effect of radiative transfer by an exponential decrease uh, related to the uh, visual extension in the PDR with some coefficients that's usually adjusted, uh, uh, fitted, um, compared to uh, actual computation of the, of the radiative transfer. But of course, when you use this, you have to keep in mind that this is an approximation and those parameters that you uh, use actually rely on the assumption of some uh, spectral shapes for the UV field and quite often on the assumption that the UV field is uh, isotropic. So, uh, so the value of beta might not be correct if, for instance, your model is uh, assume a unidirectional radiation field and if the beta value was derived from an isotropic uh, radiation field. <laughs> so this is the simplest approximation. The question is, when is this kind of approximation reasonable? Let's look at the, uh, an important case in PDRs, which is uh, carbon ionization. So what I show here is the ionization, um, the ionization cross section of for carbon ionization for carbon. Sorry. Uh, so you see here the cross section as a function of wavelengths. This is the Lyman limit, so 912 angstroms, which means that in these regions, in a PDR, there will be no photons left. So we are only interested in this. And you see that it's nearly constant up to some thresholds where it goes to zero, simply because photons with larger wavelengths than uh, this value don't have enough energy to uh, ionize uh, carbon. So in this case, of course, if the ionization cross-section is nearly constant, you can very, very simply uh, do the calculation yourself and verify that in this case, this expression can be uh, reduced to an expression of this form. Um, the other thing to notice about this is that for very abundant species, for instance, uh, carbon is a relatively abundant species in, in a PDR, the absorption due to this uh, reaction, carbon ionization, can actually be, uh, play an important role in the extinction of the UV field. And so carbon being ionized can protect other species deeper in the cloud 
from uh, uh, being dissociated, for instance, typically for uh, uh, CO. Uh, taking into account shielding by, by uh, carbon uh, absorption is important if you want to compute precisely the position where uh, uh, CO starts to form. So here again, we see that there are couplings and that the couplings are in both direction. If you want to compute the chemistry, you need the relative transfer. But as well, if you want to compute the relative transfer accurately, for instance, take into account the extinction by carbon, you need to compute the chemistry in order to know how much carbon there is at the different positions, uh, the different depths in the PDRs. So again, uh, we see again this uh, pattern that we will see very often in these presentations that all the physical uh, aspects are coupled and need to be solved simultaneously. Uh, so let's have a look at what uh, uh, those cross section actually look like for a, a wider range of uh, species. Actually, uh, photo dissociation cross sections can have very complicated, very complicated shapes depending on the mechanisms. If, the, if, if it's simply the photons, the, the photon absorption bringing the species in a, a, into an unbound state, so a dissociated state directly, then the cross section is relatively simple. It's uh, relatively continuous. But we've seen, for instance, that for H2, it was a more complicated molecule, where, a more complicated uh, process, where you first excite to uh, an electronic excited state and then decay into a dissociated state. And then your cross section will be grouped in lines. And there are other uh, complicated processes, for instance, some processes where you absorb a photon into an excited but bound level. But this level is at the same energy as the unbound continuum. And so it can transition without emitting a photon into a dissociated state. And here again, it will give cross sections that have uh, the shape of, uh, that takes the shape of lines, of uh, discrete lines. And so as a result, I show here just a few cross sections for different molecules. And you see that uh, photo dissociation cross sections can have very complicated shape. And so in this case, they are not at all constant with wavelengths. And the simple approximations that we discussed before can uh, be pretty wrong if, uh, if uh, well, in, can be pretty wrong. Um, <clears throat> one thing to notice as well is that for species that have photodissociation cross section, uh, which are in the form of discrete lines, and if the species is uh, abundant, then you can have a self shielding effect. So we saw that self shielding was important for H2, but you see that CO also have a cross section uh, in the form of lines, and CO is uh, a pretty abundant molecule in in PDRs. So self shielding, this uh, idea of self shielding will be also important for CO. So let's talk about a, uh, a bit about uh, CO self shielding. So as I said, CO self shielding will be important because CO is pretty abundant and it, uh, it is photo dissociated by line absorption. Um, and so of course, as for H2, the most accurate way to uh, compute this is to actually compute the full relative transfer on a wavelength grid that resolves the lines, but there are also uh, the, the, uh, people have also used the similar idea of using approximation by uh, empirical shielding functions. But when you do this, you have to keep in mind one important point is that the lines that dissociate CO and the lines that dissociate H2 uh, very often overlap. You see here, for instance, so this is uh, two spectra, uh, UV spectra inside the PDR computed by fully solving the relative transfer on a, a fine wavelength grid. In yellow, you see the spectrum. If we only take into account uh, absorption by H2 uh, dissociation lines, and in blue, when you also take into account the absorption by CO uh, uh, dissociation lines, and you see that in some regions, they overlap, which means that photons that could dissociate CO uh, will have been absorbed by H2 before, so H2 can shield CO. This is what we call mutual shielding. And so the commonly used uh, uh, approximate shielding functions, uh, for instance, the one in Lee uh, et al. Uh, 96 or Visser et al. Uh, 2009, uh, 
do account for those uh, mutual shielding effects. And just um, this is a very quick overview of the different types of chemical reactions that are important. But when you go deeper into the PDR, you have less and less uh, UV photons. And cosmic rays will start to be the dominant uh, energy input. And you will start to get closer to the chemistry that is typical of, uh, of uh, cold, uh, dense, uh, molecular clouds in which the chemistry is driven by cosmic rays. So you will have uh, cosmic rays induced reactions, which depends on uh, uh, the value of the cosmic ray flux. And this is not very well known. Estimations in different uh, environments tend to vary a lot. So, so this is something to keep in mind as well. <laughs> now, uh, this is not all there is to know about chemistry, there is one very important point, especially for PDRs, is that uh, a lot of important reactions can be either endothermic reaction, meaning that the, the molecule that you form is less stable than the reactants, meaning that you need to provide energy in order to form this molecule. But there are also reactions that might not be endothermic, uh, but that might have an, an activation barrier, meaning that to go from the reactant to the product, you need to pass an, an, an energy barrier. And in both of those cases, this means that in your uh, rate coefficient, you will have, uh, sorry, I forgot a, a minus here. Uh, you will have an exponential term. And th this exponential term will result in the fact that your reaction will only become efficient when Kt, so the temperature of the gas, becomes close to this activation energy. So this means that chemistry in PDR will be very sensitive to the gas temperature. And this is one more example of uh, why we need to couple everything. To compute the chemistry, we need to compute the gas temperature. And we'll see, we will see that the re reverse is true uh, as well. But temperature is not the only way to uh, cross this activation energy, especially in PDRs. Uh, the first thing we need to uh, note is that a lot of those of very important uh, reactions for PDRs are reactions that have a, a large activation barrier. For instance, O plus H2 to form OH, or C plus plus H2 to form CH plus, which are both the starting point of a very complex uh, chemistry they both have a high uh, activation energy. And you can see that those activation energies are a bit high, even for PDR temperatures. Because in the molecular uh, region, in the warm molecular region of the PDR, I said that the typical temperature was of uh, several hundreds of Kelvin. So it's still a bit too low to, to, for those reactions to be very efficient. But there is another way to uh, cross those activation barrier. Uh, oops, sorry. You remember this, uh, this uh, uh, figure where I show that uh, because of UV excitation of H2 into uh, electronically excited state, you could then dissociate H2. But I said that a large fraction of the time, uh, H2 actually transitions back into the ground electronic state, but into excited uh, vibrational states. <clears throat> so this means that in PDRs, where you where we have molecular gas that's submitted to UV photons, we have a lot of uh, vibrationally excited H2 that's populated due to this mechanism, sorry, uh, of pumping into an electronic state and decay into a vibrationally excited state. And the idea is that this, so H2 in a PDR will have a lot of internal energy in the form of vibrational excitation. And this internal energy can help to cross uh, the activation barrier. Um, sorry. Okay, so the, the idea, it's a very simplified picture. Of course, things are more complicated than that if you look at the, the, the quantum theory of those kind of reactions. But the very basic idea is that if you want to go from C++ plus plus H2 to this, you have to cross an activation barrier. But now, if your reaction is not between C++ plus and H2, not in the ground uh, raw vibrational state, but H2 in an excited state. And I gave you here the, the energy, but translated into Kelvin's uh, corresponding to the first uh, excited vibrational state and the second vib excited vibrational state. You see that then in H2, you have more energy than this barrier, meaning that it's a bit like if uh, your reactant 
were above the, the activation barrier, and then this reaction can proceed very efficiently. But of course, what this means is that in order to compute the rates of those reactions efficiently, you need to compute in detail the population of H2 in the different levels. So again, an example of coupling between chemistry and uh, excitation. And for this, if you want to do this precisely, you need to know not only uh, uh, global rates of reaction, but state to state reaction rates. So reaction rates depending on the states of the reactants. Uh, and those are only starting to be available. They are available for a few reactions, for instance, C plus plus H2 or S plus plus H2. But there are many uh, of those type of reactions where we don't know, we don't yet have theoretical calculations for the state to state uh, reaction rates. And this might affect a lot uh, the results. For instance, you see here what happened when you take this into account for the formation of CH plus, so this reaction. And you see that if you don't take into account the internal of energy of H2, or if you take into account this internal energy, you can change the abundance of CH plus by a factor of 25. So you can have very large increase in the reaction rates. And why this is important is that in the chemical network of, uh, of uh, PDRs, so those are very simplified. They are from a pretty old paper. Of course, now PDR models use much larger uh, chemical networks with uh, thousands of uh, reactions. But you see that, especially for if we are interested in, in CO, which is uh, an important molecule in PDR, there are a lot of pathways to form CO that start with those uh, reactions with endothermic uh, barriers. For instance, O plus excited H2 that uh, gives OH, or C plus plus excited H2 uh, from CH plus that then from CO plus that from CO, and so on. So this shows that uh, compute, taking into account this uh, hot chemistry uh, uh, that's uh, allowed by the excitation of H2 is really important if you want to understand, for instance, CO, which, is a, which has been a key tracer of PDR uh, uh, since uh, Her the Herschel Space Telescope, and which is also a very important coolant of the gas. So it will also have an impact on your calculation of the temperature of the gas. And we will talk more about the temperature of the gas in a few moments. And the other important impact is that because of those uh, reactions that are triggered by uh, excited H2, you can have molecules closer to the edge of the PDR because the formation rate is, is more efficient, so they will survive closer to the edge. This means in warmer gas, and this will mean that you will have brighter lines, you will predict brighter lines uh, of uh, your species. And this was, for instance, important in understanding the emission of uh, rotationally excited CO in, in PDRs like uh, the Orion bar. And this will also lead to many other molecules. For instance, it, it can lead to efficient formation of uh, C2H, which has been, uh, which is observed to be abundant in, in, in many PDR, PDRs. Okay, so we've talked about chemistry and we've said that in the chemistry, so to, com to compute the chemistry accurately, we've said that you need to compute the excitation of H2, and we will talk about uh, uh, computing the excitation of the molecules a bit later, but you also need to, to compute the temperature of the gas. So let's talk about how the temperature, what are the physical processes that control the temperature of the gas in uh, PDRs. <coughs> so to compute the, the temperature of the gas, so the, here we stay in the assumption of stationary PDR models. Uh, as I said before, this is a, a very common assumption, but it might not always be uh, 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 correct. In this case, your temperature will be controlled by the balance between the total heating rate and the total cooling rate. And this, those rates depend on the temperature, but of course they also depend on a lot of different things, the uh, abundance of the different chemical species, the UV fields, and so they depend of this balance, of course, depend on position. So the temperature that you compute, you will have to compute it at each uh, position. Uh, just a, a word about notations, depending on the, uh, in the literature, you can find different notations. Sometimes those gamma and lambda are used as they are used here to uh, designate heating rates per unit volume. So in ergs per centimeter cubed per second minus one, but Often you will also find the balance written in this way, 
And here then the gamma and the lambda are not the same quantities. You can see that the units will be different. And the idea when, when people write it like this, it is to extract the main dependencies of those terms to the density, because most often the heating processes will be proportional to the density only, while the cooling processes will be proportional to uh, the square of the density. So, uh, but in PDRs, quite often we use this uh, form because they, there are a wider range of heating mechanisms in PDRs and some of them will have a de uh, density dependency in, in square. So this simplification is not as relevant in PDR as it is, in, for instance, in the diffuse uh, ISM. <laughs> so let's talk first about the heating mechanisms. So the most important heating mechanism in the, in the ISM, and this is also true for the diffuse ISM, is photoelectric effect on grains, which is when UV photons uh, heat, well, are absorbed by a grain, they can uh, uh, release an electron, a high energy electron into the gas. And this, this electron will then uh, collision with gas uh, uh, atoms and molecules. So it will thermalize with the gas. And, and transmit its energy to the gas. So it will be a heating term for the gas. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the energy of this electron will be the excess energy, the difference between the energy you need to ionize, for instance, for a pH, the energy you need to ionize the pH, and the energy of the photon. So if the photon has more energy than the ionization potential, the difference between the two will be transmitted to the gas. For bigger grain, it's a bit more complicated because quite often the photon is absorbed deeper inside the grain. So the electron is released inside of the grain and it has to uh, escape to the surface. And during this escape, it will lose some energy, uh, which is often called the work function. And so the, the, the energy of the final electron will be a bit less. The result of this is that the photoelectric uh, heating mechanism is most efficient for small grains and PAHs and less efficient for very big grain. And uh, one thing you need to know is that to compute precisely the efficiency of this mechanism, this depends on the charge of the grain. Because of course, depending on how the, the grain is charged, uh, liberating an electron will be easier or more difficult. And so uh, this requires computing the charge distribution of the grains. And we will talk, I will say a few words about uh, the physics of dust grains uh, in, in a few moments. But of course, people have uh, uh, proposed um, simpler approximations to avoid having to solve in detail the physics of the grain which are actually uh, approximations that are fitted to complete calculations of the physics of the grain. And the most often used one is this one. But you have to remember that those kind of approximations all, always rely on assumptions that might not be consistent with, uh, with your model. For instance, this assumption will rely on the spectral shape of the UV field and also on a specific uh, grain population. So a specific distribution of uh, grain uh, sizes and grain types, silicates, uh, carbon grains, so on. Uh, and, and in this approximation, it's based on the MRN distribution, which I will uh, say a word later. So uh, to be fully consistent with the specific spectral shape and the specific dust population of a given PDR, you would need to compute in detail the charge distribution of each uh, grain sizes. Uh, but photoelectric heating is not the only uh, important mechanism in PDRs. Um, in PDRs, <laughs> you can also have heating from this uh, uh, UV pumping mechanism that I discussed before. Because if you absorb the UV photon and go into an electronic excited state, uh, as I said, most of the time it will uh, decay to a rough vibrational excited state. If you are in a very diffuse environment, then this uh, vibrationally excited H2 will decay by emitting uh, further infrared photon and decay uh, down the raw vibrational ladder down to the lowest uh, states. But if you are in a dense environment, uh, as you are in, a, in dense PDRs, then collisions can compete with uh, relative transition in this decay. And so ener the energy can be transmitted to the gas and you can hit the gas. And this is uh, uh, quite efficient in, sorry, in PDRs uh, when you are at uh, uh, relatively high densities 
and especially at low G0 over NH, because if you remember, we said that at low G0 over NH, the photons are, are mostly absorbed by H2 rather than by dust. So there will be a lot of pumping of H2 with, and the energy can then be transmitted to the gas. Uh, I show here, for instance, a graph showing where the, uh, this H2 heating mechanism can be more efficient than photoelectric uh, heating mechanism. There are approximate formulas for this mechanism, but again, uh, those rely on assumption. And the only way to have a fully consistent uh, uh, estimate is to uh, compute the full vibrational excitation of H2, including UV pumping. Uh, and uh, as, I, as we saw before, it, it needs to be computed anyway, because you need it for uh, the chemistry and for the, this hot PDR chemistry that I discussed. And there are many other uh, uh, heating processes that are a bit more secondary, but that sometimes can be important in specific regions of a PDR, but I, I won't have time to uh, discuss those in details. So let's say a word now about cooling. So the temperature, as I said, will be controlled by the balance between heating and cooling. So you, we've discussed uh, the heating processes, Cooling in PDRs and in most of the ISM will occur mainly through a line emission. So the idea is pretty simple. You have some molecule or atom. It collides with another particle from the gas, for instance, here, H2. And this collision excites your species to an excited level, which then decay radiatively by emitting a photon. And this photon leaves the cloud. And so the energy is uh, evacuated. And and, and this will contribute to uh, cooling the gas. In PDRs, the most important uh, coolants will be C plus and uh, oxygen, and also uh, molecules uh, H2 and CO. And in some specific regimes and in some specific regions, you can have other species that also contribute, but I won't have time to go into the details uh, in this uh, presentation. So the result of this is that to, to calculate the cooling uh, rates, you will need as well to solve the, the population in the different levels for the species that contribute to the cooling. And we will uh, talk about this next slide. And another very important point is that here I said that in order to have cooling, you need this photon to escape the cloud. But of course, in some cases, some cooling lines can become optically thick, meaning that the photon will be reabsorbed by another uh, atom or molecule before leaving the cloud. And in this case, if it doesn't escape the cloud, then the energy is not evacuated and you have no cooling. So again, it shows that here again, we see that to compute the temperature, we need to solve relative transfer. We see one more example of this idea that everything is coupled and needs to be solved uh, simultaneously. There is one last uh, uh, process that can be important in, in, in some cases, which is collisions between gas and dust. If the, uh, if the dust is colder than the gas, which is uh, most often the case in PDRs, then it can contribute to uh, cooling the gas. But I, I won't have time to say more about this. Uh, so we, we've said that in order to compute cooling, we need to compute the excitation. So let's uh, have a quick word about the different excitation processes. So we've seen that you can have collisional excitation and de-excitation processes. And if you had only those processes, you know that then the populations of the different level would follow a Boltzmann distribution at the gas temperature, which has uh, this form. But of course, you also have a spontaneously, spontaneous uh, de-excitation, radiative uh, uh, de-excitations, uh, which emit a photon, which are what allow uh, cooling. And you might have uh, seen this in previous uh, presentations, but you know that when you have only collisions and spontaneous uh, de-excitations, then this uh, Boltzmann distribution is only still valid if your density is higher than some uh, critical density, which, is, uh, which expresses the competition between the efficiency of radiative transition, given by those Einstein coefficients, and the efficiency of collisional transition given by the collision coefficients. But if the density is lower than the critical density, then you don't have LT, but that's actually when uh, the cooling is most efficient. Because in this case, when uh, radiative transition dominates, it means that for each upward collisional uh, transition, uh, you have one downward radiative transition. For, so for each collision, you emit a photon. While when you are in LTE regime, most 
collisional excitation is compensated by collisional de-excitation and the cooling efficiency is much less. But that's not all. You also have a, a induced radiative transition. So you can absorb a photon that can pump the molecule or the atom or the ion to an excited level. And depending on the range, the wavelength range of the photon, this will be called UV pumping or infrared pumping. And those, we've seen that those, this mechanism of pumping is very important for H2 with UV pumping, but you can also have very important effects of infrared pumping. And in this case, the, the important point is that you can have molecules in your PDR that are pumped by, by infrared photons that are emitted by the dust grains in your PDR as well, but in a different region. For instance, you can have the dust at the edge of the PDR, which absorbs UV photons, so it becomes uh, pretty warm. It emits a lot of infrared photons. As you know, infrared photons are absorbed less than UV photons by dust grains, so they will propagate deeper into the cloud. And so deep into the cloud, you can have molecules in a regions where there is very little UV, but there might be a lot of infrared coming from the dust at the edge. And those infrared photons can pump some molecules and, and strongly affect their excitation and the lines they emit. And this is the case, for instance, for molecules such as H2O, water. Which means that to compute the excitation of those molecules, you also need to compute the dust temperature as a function of position in your PDR. And I will talk about this uh, in a few slides. Is that all for excitation? No, that would be too simple. There, are, there is actually one more uh, process that's important, in, uh, in, especially in PDRs, because in PDRs, the chemical time scales are very fast, which means that destruction and formation uh, can matter in computing the excitation of the species. So one more coupling between chemistry and excitation. The idea is the following. Imagine you have some uh, molecule and it is destroyed. So for instance, by a photo dissociation. Because you are considering a stationary model, it means that each destruction reaction must be compensated by a formation reaction. But now if this formation reaction forms your molecule with some internal energy, you see that this cycle of destruction and reformation is kind of equivalent to a transition from a lower state to a higher excited state. And so by this, uh, destruction formation cycle, you can pump your molecules into excited state. And this is called uh, chemical pumping. Uh, and and you, you see that excitation and chemistry are coupled both way. Because here, to compute the excitation, you need to know the chemistry, the rates of those reactions. And we've seen earlier that to compute the chemistry, for instance, the formation of CH+, you need to know uh, the excitation of H2. Um, and this effect is, is important for some uh, very important tracers of PDR, for instance, uh, CH plus and, uh, and OH. Now, the idea is pretty simple. Here you see that when you form CH plus from excited H2, uh, because you have so much energy in your reactant, you will very often form CH plus in an excited state. And this can uh, lead to important chemical pumping of CH plus. Um, so I will skip this, uh, this slide just to say that, of course, for, to compute excitation, you can use some approximations that might be valid in some regimes. But again, because in PDRs, uh, the condition varies with, with position, you have a very wide range of conditions to consider in your model. And very often, there is no approximation that is valid in all of the regimes that are present. So you need to fully solve uh, the excitation so solve the statistical equilibrium of level population, which is uh, governed by this equation, which I won't have time to uh, describe. Uh, I said before, when I talked about excitation, we saw that one of the uh, important excitation mechanism could be infrared pumping by uh, uh, photons emitted by dust grains, which means that you need to uh, compute the temperature of dust grains which of course varies with position in the PDR. So let's talk very quickly about uh, uh, um, dust grains. Of course, on Mondays, you will have lectures about uh, dust models. So you will have much more details about this, but just very quickly, dust grains, we haven't talked about them much, but they actually play a very important role in PDRs. You've seen that they contribute a lot to radiative transfer through absorption and scattering, and also to excitation through this uh, source term in, in infrared, which can lead to non-local uh, coupling. Um, 
And if they also uh, play a role in photoelectric heating, gas dust collision, and in H2 formation. <clears throat> so in a PDR model, you will need to have some model of the dust population, uh, meaning knowing how much dust is in uh, carbonaceous grains or silicate grains, and for each of those grains types, uh, to know how much grains are in the small dust particles and how much are in large dust particles. So the size distribution, I show a few here. And then you need to compute, for instance, the temperature or the charge of uh, dust grain need to be computed for each uh, size because the properties of dust grains are very di different depending on the sizes. But I won't have time uh, to say more about this. One very important point is that in PDR, you, we expect the dust population to vary with depth because we know that we expect the dust population to vary with physical conditions, the UV field, the density. But this is still mostly unstudied in PDR models and could really lead to a, a huge change in our understanding of PDRs. Uh, yes. So thank you, Emeric. I think we reach 3 p.m. Okay. Can you uh, I will conclude? Con yeah. Yes, I will conclude. So I will skip this, but of course, I haven't talked about uh, ice chemistry, which is one more. Uh, complication that needs to be included in, in PDR models. And I want to conclude on the uh, PDR codes that you can use. So I've listed here. Um, so one thing to know, as you've seen, there is a lot of physics that need to be included in uh, PDR models, which means that the long-term maintenance and development of PDR models requires a team working over decades, which means that there has been a large number of PDR models that have been developed, but there are actually only a few PDR codes that are actively being maintained and developed beyond the initial version. And I've listed here mostly the codes that are either publicly available but, or provide uh, uh, publicly available grids of uh, model results. Uh, and you have here the links for, for those uh, codes. And I will stop here because I, I've run out of time, but that was my last uh, slide. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we will have a coffee discussion. So, so there have been quite a of activity in the Slack. So you have a lot of questions. So you may answer them later if you want. So I, I try to group them by um, category. Yeah. So um, the first question is, what is, in your opinion, the best way to estimate the FUV field from G0 from observation of external galaxies? And in what case the spectral shape of the UV field in PDR region is different from the one assumed by Bake and Tielens in 1994? So what I would uh, summarize, does the shape matter in PDR? Okay, so I see two parts in this question. Uh, first, the question of the, the shape of the UV field and, and when can it vary? Um, it will, for instance, vary depending on the type of stars that illuminating a PDR. For instance, an O star will have a much harsher UV field than a B star. So you can have pretty large variation between an, uh, a PDR illuminate, illuminated by an O star and a PDR illuminated by a B star. And this is even strong, even more important when you move to, as I said, PDR models can be, uh, have been used for a wide range of environments. And for instance, protoplanetary disks or planetary nebula. And in those cases, the, the, the illuminated field can be very different to the one that is uh, commonly assumed in, uh, in uh, so does it affect the chemistry and all the shape of the PDR if you change so, the shape of the field? So this has not been uh, studied in detail to my knowledge, but I would expect it yes to have probably not a, a, a critical effect, but it can uh, change the, the predicted line intensities and so on. And the second part of the question, which was about estimating the UV field in, in external galaxies, I think this is a very difficult question because when you observe PDRs in our galaxies, in, in nearby star forming region, as we've said, with now with ALMA and soon with JWST, we can start to resolve the PDR. But when you observe external galaxy, the emission that you receive is a mixture of uh, the emission of all the PDRs in your galaxy. And you might have a mixture of some low density PDRs, some high density PDRs, some that are so some contribution from different types of region. And so it's very difficult to disentangle this mixture and, and derive uh, 
Uh, I think this is a, a, a very tough problem to, to disentangle the mixture of contributions when you observe uh, external galaxies. Yeah, definitely. So the second question is, um, how much do the characteristic time scales change with metallicity? Will the assumption of a stationary PDR still be valid in the low metallicity dwarfs? So that's a good question. Actually, I, I, I haven't thought so much about it, but from the reasoning that we presented, which was here, you see that the characteristic time scale um, would be uh, here you have the efficiency of H2 formation and dust grains. So of course, if you move to lower metallicities, then this you have less dust grains. So the formation efficiency uh, decreases. So you would have your characteristic time scale that increases. So then you the, 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 the equilibrium time scale of your PDR will become larger. And so for instance, dynamical effects might start to 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 keep the PDR out of equilibrium more easily, indeed. Hmm. OK. So I have another question, which is about the high temperature and the infrared pumping. So you advocate that the chemistry can change if you are in an excited uh, state, of course. So are you advocating a state-to-state -state chemistry and a state-to-state -state chemistry network? which may be very large and uncertain. I mean, well, uh, yeah, uh, indeed. Large is for sure, but useful. So indeed, we need to, to we cannot think, first, we don't know the, the reaction, the state-to-state -state reaction rates for, for many, many reactions. We only know it for a few. So we need to focus on the most important, the so one that can be if, uh, affected by uh, formation bumping. If I come back, uh, where was it? It was later. No, no, it was here. Okay, if I come back uh, here, for instance, it's typically reactions where um, where the reaction will be um, how to say it. It's typically for species that are short-lived because if I come back to uh, where was it to. Uh, no, sorry, that's here. Yes. Um, so how can we uh, say this? It's typically for species that cannot, well, for which the formation is very inefficient in the absence of state-to-state uh, -state chemistry. Of course, if your reaction is already efficient without state-to-state uh, -state chemistry, for instance, for exothermic reactions without activation barriers. Uh, in a warm PDR, your reaction is already uh, almost at its full efficiency. So then it doesn't really make sense to, uh, to include state-to-state uh, -state chemistry. But uh, when, you, when in, in a chemical network, you see that there is a, one reaction that could be a pathway, but that is blocking the development of the chemistry because there is an activation barrier, then we need to think about is there a way for internal, energy, internal excitation of the reactants to uh, play a role? So those are the reactions for which it can be important. Mm. But isn't it the same than using an Arrhenius law? So uh, you mean- uh, Including a temperature dependence? Yes. So at first, when uh, when those state-to-state uh, -state rates were not available, people have tried to modify this in order to include in the temperature, uh, to modify the temperature to include the fact that one of the reactants was in, in an excited state. Uh, or, or said otherwise, it's equivalent to reducing the activation uh, energy by the uh, energy of the reactants, the excited reactant. And what has been found is act actually it tends to overestimate a bit uh, the formation efficiency when you don't have the, the actual state-to-state -state rates. So to be accurate, you actually need the state-to-state -state rates. Okay, so I have a related question. Is uh, some chemical network implemented in molecular cloud simulation codes tend to overestimate carbon abundance with respect to what is observed? So do you think it's coming from this excitation and the so, um, 
I think atomic carbon is a is a is a difficult question when we compare uh, PDR codes, and when we, for instance, change slightly the way a radiative transfer is computed, we see that the size of the region in a PDR that we predict to have atomic carbon can change quite a lot. Now, if I come back to a, the profile of a PDR, for instance, here. So you see here, there is a pretty wide atomic carbon uh, region, but this is actually a prediction of the models that's very sensitive on the way the radiative transfer is uh, made. So I think the uncertainty on this is not only due to chemical networks, but also on, on, on actually computing accurately the radiative transfer. It's, uh, it's a complicated point. Okay, so now let's I go to the slides you didn't show actually. <laughs> so is it possible that the metals locked up in dust grain can react with some of the reactive species found in the PDR? If yes, is there any modeling done usually to include the effect of such reaction? I mean, grain reaction. But also uh, in the question, there is also the difference between chemist option and physicist option, I guess. Uh, okay, I see. Uh, so usually what's what's considered when talking about surface chemistry, uh, more than a reaction between uh, gas species and, species and, for instance, elements that would be uh, stuck in the mantle, is reaction between adsorbed species, for instance, in ice chemistry. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't heard, but I, I might not be aware of it. I haven't heard of uh, direct reactions with, for instance, metals in, in inside the grain being important. But what can happen is that if your grain start to be uh, destroyed in the PDR, for instance, by UV uh, photons, or it's also the case when you have shocks, then you can uh, release metals from the uh, dust grains into the gas and you can enhance the elemental abundance of some uh, metals in the gas. Okay. So first question, next question is about pH actually. So the pH, would they come from the stellar wind which only happen in the AGB phase and they break as you say, so that we see the small product in the PDR or I've been, I've been, been already there from some earlier supernova wind residing in the cloud. Um, so I think dust evolution is probably, at least in PDRs, one of the less least uh, studied so far uh, question. And this is a very important subject for future developments. Um, for instance, you, you can reform you could reform PHs in PDRs because you're, you have a lot of UV photons that can break down uh, larger grains into smaller grains and that might free PHs that have been uh, uh, stuck together into larger grains during the earlier phase of uh, dense cold uh, molecular clouds. So the, 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 but of course, then they are also destroyed, the PHs in the PDR. So it's a, probably a balance between uh, formation and destruction. That's something that's really uh, unstudied in PDR models so far. So it's really, a, a, it, I think it will be a ma major subject of developments for, uh, for PDR models. So I have a quick question is, do you know if there is a good PDR model that also include uh, C and J shocks? coupling PDR modeling and uh, shock modeling? So I think the question is in which environment? Uh, no, 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 no. Is, is there a good model, a good code available coupling both uh, aspects? Well, uh, no, what, what I mean is that um, there, in, in general, there is no reason for the sh sh a shock and a PDR to be coupled together and stay at the same location. So I'm not sure I understand the, the, the need for a code that would describe both a shock and a PDR at the same time. I know that the, the uh, Paris-Durham shock code can uh, uh, describe illuminated shocks, but I, I think the regions that you will observe most often are either a PDR or a shock. Okay, so I propose we switch to the coffee room and uh, we 
continue this discussion because there have been a lot of questions. So see you in the coffee room. Okay. See you.